everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Today I'm going to be talking about going Swift and beyond. So in 2013, I attended my first WWDC. Well, I didn't actually attend it because I didn't get tickets like everyone else, but I was able to still go to all of the cool events that were happening that week. And one of the events that I went to was the annual CocoaPods meetup, where Matt Thompson, the creator of NS Hipster and AF Networking and a bunch of other cool things, gave a talk titled Third Wave Objective-C. And in his talk, he talked about the history of Objective-C, dating all the way back to the next step day, like the NS string, like next step days from, I guess, 1983, which is, wow, 33 years ago now. And the second wave came when Mac OS X was introduced and more developers joined the community. And then, last but not least, when iOS came out, even more developers came in as the third wave. And it was kind of like a gold rush, right? Remember all those flashlight apps that were like popular and people actually paid for them? In his talk, he talked about a lot of borrowed ideas. So when iOS came out, a lot of Ruby developers and Java developers, uh, even C Sharp developers, and a bunch of developers from different communities came and joined and introduced best practices like testing and tooling into Objective-C. And then in 2014, Swift was announced. And now we're in the first wave of Swift. And that's really, really exciting. And as we started learning Swift, at least me, like when I was first writing Swift, I was kind of just applying old patterns that I use in Objective-C and just using the new language. But as I got more comfortable with it, I started like experimenting a little bit. And now I realize that there are different design patterns that apply in Swift. And Swift also impacts how we write code as well. So today I'd like to focus on three things. So first of all, how does Swift affect what kind of code we write and what kind of design patterns we use? Second, how does Swift change how we write our code and work as a team? And last but not least, let's talk a little bit about why we do things the way we do. So first, what? So at Venmo, we've been rewriting our Objective-C app, which is like really old now. It's from 2011. And even though we're mostly rewriting the same things, I noticed that we're doing different things for that. And let me walk you through one of the features that we had to build. So the Venmo app looks a little bit like this. So if you open the app, you see a social feed. So like at any social app, you can scroll up and down. You can tap into one of the stories. And you can look at more information about it. And one of these stories might be modeled like this. So the story has an ID, title, message, has a sender, or recipient, date, and a few other things. And then we can show all these in a stories view controller, which has a list of stories, and you can tap into one of them, and we present a story detail view controller. And story detail view controller can be initialized using a story. And the implementation might look something like this. So it has a bunch of subviews, and in the initializer, we use that story and set all these subviews. So this is pretty fine. Like we have immutable, non-optional things. Like once you make it, it doesn't change at all, and things are working well. And then as we were implementing more features, we had to implement push notifications. And for push notifications, we need to handle all these URL schemes and. Now, instead of going from the feed to showing the detail, we have to go from some random ID of a story to showing the detail view directly. So there's a slight problem, because right now we need a story to show a detail view controller. But now we need to be able to initialize it with an ID. So my first instinct was, well, maybe I can just add another initializer in it with story ID. So I started implementing it. I was like, OK, so in it with story is still the same. That's all good. But in it with story ID, hmm. Well, I can't really do anything because title view needs a story, and all these other views requires a story for them to be initialized. I was like, OK, I guess I can like start making all these optional and set them as nil at first. And maybe in the view to load, we can make a call to the API and set all these views, and it'll be fine. But I looked at this code, and I was like, well, First of all, these are all optional. And before, like, it was all there when you initialized it. But now there are four optional things. That means there are, what, 16 different ways things can be optional or non-optional. And worst of all, these are all vars. So technically, they can be like anything to, to, after it's been initialized. And that kind of sucks. Like, if we're making everything vars and everything optional, I could just be writing Objective-C. And I don't want to be writing Swift for the sake of writing Swift. I want to write Swift so I can write better code. 
So I thought about it a little bit more, and I was like, okay, I have an idea. So I made this thing called the Story Container View Controller. So I just pulled, a, pulled out a parent view controller and decided to load everything in this parent view controller and make a request in view to load. And then when the result comes back with a successful story, then I can create a story detail view controller with that story and set, set it as a child view controller. And that worked great. And now we could just create a story con container view controller with story ID, and that worked. But as we were implementing more push notifications, we realized that we had to apply the same pattern to everything else as well. So for example, we might need to show a user's profile, or maybe we need to show a message from some friend. <coughs> OK, wouldn't it be nice if we can make this a little bit more generic? So we defined a protocol, and this is called the remote content, what is it called? Coordinator, it has a really long name. So it has a type alias, so content, and that can either be like a story or a user, a message, whatever you want it to be. And then this coordinator defines two things. First, how you fetch the content, so that you probably want to make the request to the API there. And second, how you create a view controller based on that content that you get. And then an even wordier one. So this one is called Remote Content Container View Controller, and it's ge generic on type T, which is conforming to Remote Content Coordinator. And this thing can be initialized with a coordinator that you want. And in the viewed load, we ask the coordinator to fetch the content. And once you have content, you can ask the coordinator again, hey, can you get me the view controller for this? And again, we're just adding it as a child view controller to this container view controller. So let's see what it would look like for our stories example. So we can define a story coordinator that is a remote content coordinator. And you can initialize it using an ID. And fetch content is just calling show story on our API client. All this does is it makes a request to our API and gets the response. And then in view controller for content, in successful cases, we can create a story detail view controller because we have the story. And in error cases, maybe you can just show an error view controller with whatever title we want. And by doing this, we were able to make stories work as before. So you can make a story coordinator with ID 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and remote content container view controller with this coordinator. And the same pattern applies for users. You can define a user coordinator very similarly to a stories coordinator. And then same for messages. So instead of letting your code turn into this mess here, we're able to keep story detail view controller very immutable and I guess more solid. And I think it's really important because you don't want the core of your code to get immutable and kind of soggy. If you can, you can make maintain that and kind of push that out into some other thing in like an outer layer and do all the nasty things there. That was a little bit about code. But does Swift affect how we work as a team? So as many of you know, Swift is open source. And you can find all the code at github.com apple slash Swift. And that's really cool. And there's a bunch of cool stuff in there. But I think what's even cooler is Swift evolution. So this is a forum where you can open a pull request and suggest changes to improve the Swift language. And then, as you might imagine, there's a process that comes with it. And they offer this template, what you want to change, why you want to change it, what your solution is, and a little bit more about your solution, what, how it impacts the existing code, and what alternatives you considered. So we're like, oh, this is really cool. Like, we've never actually, or at least I have never opened up a proposal to Swift Evolution. But we thought it was really cool. And we decided to steal this process. So now, in our Venmo OS team, we have this repo called Blueprint. And every time you want to make a sweeping change to the code base or implement a new feature, we open up a pull request to Blueprint and use the exact same template uh, structure that Apple uses, Swift Evolution. And we've been really enjoying this so far. So now, we spend most of our time planning, like 80% of our time planning and writing the proposal, reviewing everything, and then about 20% of the time coding. Because by the time you're coding, you know exactly what you want to build. And this is really nice, because before, it used to be kind of like the opposite. We'd spend maybe 80% of our time coding, and then 20% of our time arguing 
in a pull request. And ar the arguing and going back and forth is fine, but what's even worse is when you kind of just like give up and let things get merged in, even though you don't completely feel happy about it. And I think that's because like once you have code, it feels really awkward or like wasteful to offer a lot of feedback. And even the even if you're like a solo developer, I think using this template structure really helps you think through what you want to build and how you want to build it. So I'm standing here on stage talking about Swift, and I flew all the way from San Francisco. But believe it or not, before Swift came out, I loved Objective C. Like, like I really liked it. And people who wrote cooler programming language programming languages like Ruby and Python, even like JavaScript developers, maybe CoffeeScript if that's still a thing. They made fun of Objective-C all the time. And I always defended it. I was completely happy with Objective-C. And yeah, but when Swift came out, I started thinking a little bit more and kind of thinking like, what kind of, like even though Swift is like the coolest thing right now, maybe there are cooler things out there in the future and we shouldn't be happy with what we have right now. And when WWC 2014 rolled around, and I came back to the office, everyone was talking about Swift. Even like Ruby developers and JavaScript developers, like all those developers who were making fun of Objective-C were now talking about Swift. And I thought about it more, and well, generics and enums with associated values and protocols, well, whether we like it or not, Java had those before us. And optionals and value types and the idea of functional programming well, functional programming languages like Haskell already have that. So why do we actually care about all these new features and or new features that we've kind of stolen from other programming languages? And I think the reason why I like Swift so much is because Swift really makes us focus in on what's really important. Like optionals and generics and all those features, it lets us write safer code. And why do we want that? I think that's because we want to ship a great product that users love. And Swift kind of lets us realign or focus on that. And in order to do this, I think we need the best ideas. And in order to get the best ideas, we need a lot of ideas. So how do we get a lot of ideas? Well, I think there are several ways we can do this. So first of all, we want to share a lot of knowledge. And what do I mean by sharing? Well, Maybe you can write something. So I started my Swift blog, I think, in October. And before that, I was like, well, I can't really start a blog until I have a clever title and a cool domain name. But I ended up just going with Learn Swift, which is kind of unimaginative. But I was like, whatever. I, I want to write. I'm just going to go with a boring title and write anyway. So if you're thinking about writing, you should totally start writing right now. And if you're feeling a little bit more adventurous, maybe you can speak at a conference or a meetup or a local tech event. And if you want to start with something smaller, maybe you can recommend books or articles. And it doesn't have to be about Swift or Objective-C. I think it's even better if it's not about Swift and Objective-C. Because, like I said, like, I was super happy with Objective-C before Swift. So now I'm reconsidering, like, well, maybe I should learn other programming, programming languages. And I think the flip side of this is trying things. So what do I mean by trying? So maybe you can fix a bug in the backend code or web code. I tried this, and I definitely made the tests fail. But in the process, I learned a lot about how their team works and how they like, do linting for Python. And it was really cool, like, kind of struggling through that process and see what, seeing what they do. Or maybe you can learn a different language. Like, I know some people who are just reading Haskell books for fun. It's like, oh, like, this is kind of similar to Swift. So, yeah, that's pretty fun to do. Or maybe, crazy idea, maybe you can talk about architecture with an Android engineer. So I started doing this more, mostly because if you think about it, Swift and Java are, are kind of similar. So I started doing this a little bit more. And most often, you're working on the same features. So why not think about the problems together? Like, a language is just a language. And it's even easier when the two languages are pretty similar. And then last but not least, you want to include. Like I said, if you want to get great ideas, you need a lot of ideas. And you can do several things to do this. So you want to get people excited about Swift. I think we're already doing a really good job of doing this. I know some people, including an Android engineer, who has converted to becoming a Swift developer. So 
Good job, us. Um, and then you also want to be open to unfamiliar ideas. So like me, like I was kind of like, oh, like Java, I don't care about it back in the Objective-C days, but now I want to learn more about all these, all these different programming languages and listen to other people and other developers from other communities. And then last but not least, we want to be a welcoming community. And we want a lot of people with their ideas and best practices from other languages, other backgrounds to join. And I think Objective-C benefited a lot from the third wave of developers coming in and bringing all their best practices. And if, I think if we do all these things and include people and share our knowledge and try new things, we can make the first wave of Swift even bigger. Thank you.